Good morning, everyone. I think we are going to get started. Our start time was um, 1.45 and we are right at 1.45 and we are very excited to have you all here. There will be others, I'm sure, joining us. And uh, I just wanted to check um, um, whether you are able to see our screen and hear us well. I don't know if you can send us a quick message in the chat to confirm that that would be great. And then we will get started here. Okay, and I'm going to look at the chat here. It looks like people are, yes, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Borshika Rabin, and uh, we are, uh, I would like to welcome you on behalf of our workshop team to the planning, documenting, and evaluating uh, adaptations for the implementation of complex real world interventions in the age of COVID 19. Uh, this workshop is going to focus on the topic of adaptations, and we will be uh, hitting on a few different topics and sharing some tools with you. First of all, I would like to introduce you to our workshop team. Uh, I'm going to do it very briefly. We provided here information where you can find us um, if you would like to connect after the workshop. Um, in addition to me, I, we have uh, Dr. Bauman, Dr. Miller, and Dr. Wiltsy Sturman here. And uh, each of us will speak today, so you will get to know a little bit of our work related to this topic and get to um, interact with us during the Q&A session. We also wanted to acknowledge that uh, although it's all the, uh, just the four of us, we are working with a number of wonderful people who are contributing our work, contributing to uh, developing adaptations. And so we listed a few of our close collaborators here, as well as some funding acknowledgements uh, for grants where we are developing these methodologies. As you might have seen uh, when you were signing up for this session, we identified four key learning objectives for us today. The first one is to provide an understanding of key concepts around adaptations as they relate to complex real world interventions. We are also going to discuss approaches for planning of adaptations prior to and during implementation, review some key considerations for planning and documenting adaptations and modifications, and finally identifying strategies to document and analyze adaptations and their impact during and after implementation. And based on these four objectives, we created three topics or three sections for our workshop today. The first one is going to be an overview of the concepts and it's gonna give you some definitions and uh, including definitions as they relate to adaptations and complex interventions. After the uh, first topic, we are going to move into thinking about adaptations as they relate to planning before implementation especially uh, cultural adaptations. And then the third topic is going to be focusing on the documentation and analysis of adaptations, including their impact as they relate to during implementation documentation. After each topic, we are going to have a, a Q&A session. And because we are expecting a larger group, we most likely have to keep this um, to answer questions from the chat. So what we would like to ask you to do is to enter your questions throughout the session into the chat. One of us will be facilitating each Q&A session and we will be picking a subset of questions that we can handle during that time frame. We will try to group these by topic. So please enter them as soon as you have those. So the person who is facilitating can start to organize those questions in their mind and pull out the ones that seem to come out more frequently. Also, all of us are going to, except for me, because I'm, I don't see my chat, answering questions in the discussion uh, chat uh, section as well offline, because um, we will not get to all the questions most likely. Um, we, are, we developed an annotated reading list and we will make that available to you. And then we are also initiating a Twitter conversation on this topic. And I will let actually Anna, when she's speaking, uh, describe it to you how to access that. So Anna, please, when you get next time uh, talking, please um, share that with the group. So at this point, we wanted to learn a little bit about you. And um, you know, we realized that uh, uh, we will not be able to get to know each other very closely because of the um, limited uh, time that we have and the large numbers. But I am going to try to seem very professional here and initiate a poll uh, with three questions. And so I would like to ask you to answer this question so we can start to uh, get to know each other. So I am going to uh, start by um, 
launching this poll and uh, I hope that you guys are able to enter the answers at this point. I can see them coming in. I will wait just a few more seconds here to give you enough time. So this is related to your DNI experience. Um, um, and uh, we are going to want to know whether you are a novice, an advanced beginner, an intermediate, or an advanced DNI researcher. Um, I see that we are getting to about 64%, 68%. Uh, and uh, I will share the results in a moment here. I will wait a couple of more seconds. Let everyone get their answers in. Very good. Okay, we have about 88, almost 90% votes in. Okay, I will say that's good enough for us to get a good sense. So let me share the results and I hope that you can see this, but I will read that. It seems like we have a very nice distribution in terms of uh, experience with dissemination and implementation of science with the largest group being advanced beginners with some skills uh, and then followed by intermediate levels. So that was very helpful. Thank you so much. Now I am going to ask you a second question, which is related to your experience with adaptations. Um, and so I am going to share that with you. Uh, so the question is, what is your experience with adaptations in your current projects? My project has made planned adaptations, made unplanned adaptations, made both planned and unplanned adaptations, did not make any adaptations um, that we planned, but uh, they are happening on the ground. And then my project did not make any adaptations at all is the question here. And we are at the 50 some percent mark. So I will wait a little bit longer for answers. Just a little bit more. People are also coming into the meeting and so our percent constantly drops because they haven't had a chance to answer. 72%. Just a couple of more seconds here. Okay, well, I am pretty comfortable that we have a good sense here. Let me share the results. So it seems like most of you felt and a good percent, it's 57% of the respondents that their project had both planned and unplanned adaptations. And then a very few percent indicated um, only 4% that they didn't make any adaptations at all and then others kind of spread out across the other options. And then the last question, this is our last poll question, is related to your um, practices around documenting adaptations in your current project or projects. So the question is whether you are not documenting adaptations at all. Are you using a systematic and very comprehensive documenting approach for adaptations? or you are trying to use some pragmatic documenting uh, of adaptations in your work. And um, we are getting some answers here. We'll wait a little bit longer. These are very helpful for us as we are thinking about the upcoming slides and uh, examples um, to understand our audience. It looks like we have about 62% who voted um, I will wait just another couple of seconds. I don't want to take up too much time. Sixty-seven percent. It's a little bit slowed down. Sixty-nine. I think people are thinking about what they are doing. How very good they classify themselves. Okay, so in the interest of time, this is 71%. I am going to stop here and share the results. And what I see is that most of you, 52% uh, of the respondents indicated the pragmatic approach to documenting adaptations, 39, the systematic comprehensive, and then 9% indicated that they are not documenting adaptations at all. Very helpful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, I'm going to try to go back to the presentation mode here. Oh, wonderful. And hand it over to Shannon and Anna who are going to lead this first topic. 
All right. So our first one is related to the concept of adaptations. And I, I will apologize. My moving is because I'm also playing with a dog, despite the fact that I took him for a long walk. So <laughs> Uh, it's it's 2020. So if we can go to the next one. So um, uh, the word adaptation is a challenge, right? In, the, in terms of adaptation has been defined as a change and modification to a program or a strategy. Adaptation often happens to improve the fit or the comp compatibility of a program, an intervention or a strategy to a new setting. Adaptation, uh, if, if you've heard us talking, is inedible, right? And, and the metaphor that I talk about that I really like is you and I do not brush our teeth in the same way, the same time, the exact same process every single day, right? We are humans. So it just happens. And it happens differently depending on the context. Um, the problem is that depending on how you adapt, it might actually uh, affect the effectiveness of the core elements of the program. So part of what you're, you will hear us talk about is um, the tracking and the importance of consider considering adaptation in the planning and in the implementation process. Next. But it's a Pandora box, right? Because if you read the literature, the word adaptation has been used in different ways. It has been used as a process for a mechanism associated with implementation. It has been used as a strategy about training how, to, how people can adapt. It has been used as a quality of an intervention, as an intervention being adaptable. And it has been used as an outcome uh, in parallel process to fidelity. So the word adaptation, depending on your sentence, can mean different things. Next. So, Historically, though, adaptation was, and I love this slide, it was the bad boy, right? It was this thing that we needed to avoid at all costs, shall not adapt. You need to be uh, adherence to fidelity because fidelity is what we want. Um, as we moved forward in the field and as we conceptualize adaptation, mm -hmm. and as we understood, especially from the cultural adaptation field, that adaptation not only happens, but can be very important uh, now uh, adaptation now is is conceptualized as something that we should embrace we can go for the next so one of the things that we have to keep an eye on as we look at adaptation is you know that the concept of drift is has been associated with this um this kind of polar opposites view of fidelity and adaptation before. Um, and, you know, if it is in fact drift, we might end up seeing that the um, intervention doesn't work as well when we implement it in a routine care setting. Um, so one of the things that it's important to understand is if we see a voltage drop, is that because fidelity is reduced? Is it because we've made adaptations that aren't helpful? And, um, but then the flip side is also important. Adaptations can actually um, not only re uh, reduce voltage drop um, challenges, but they can actually enhance um, the outcomes that we would see. Uh, next slide. And so if there is anything that we can say here is Adaptation is not good, it just happens. Uh, not only it happens, uh, but it is uh, it perhaps crucial to the implementation process, right? Um, and I see that my internet is slow. I don't know, can you guys hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. But if you start yeah. breaking up, I can jump in. Awesome. Um, so, it, and, and this is a sentence, and, and perhaps Shannon, you can, you can say it better because that is your sentence in terms of adaptation uh, is at best a missed opportunity and at worst a recipe for implementation failure, right? So it's, it's about conceptualizing and tracking and, and embracing it. You can go to the next. Yeah, and just to add on that, if we, you know, if we, if we don't 
understand it. And if we don't look at how, how, adapta how adaptation is used and how it works, then we're really missing opportunities to learn important things about enhancing effectiveness, about what different communities need. Um, and that's why it's so important to get away from this polarization. Uh, I think this one's mine, right? Okay, great. So um, just to, um, to get really clear on some of these uh, definitions and distinctions, fidelity is the skilled and appropriate delivery of core intervention components. Um, and modification is um, kind of an umbrella term that we use to describe any changes that are made to the intervention or program. Um, and then adaptation is, is kind of a subset. And these are the, the more planned proactive types of modifications, um, whereas modification is any change at all. Uh, next slide. And just to kind of visually represent this and add in the concept of fidelity, um, if modifications are any and all changes, um, adaptations are the subset that are ideally data-driven in some way or planned, you know, where we, there's an understanding or a recognition um, somehow that there is a need for adaptation and they're done in a planful way. Um, and adaptations can be fidelity consistent if they, um, if they retain the core elements or core functions, um, sort of the key aspects of the intervention. Whereas fidelity inconsistent um, modifications or adaptations are those that do not retain these core elements in some way. And those can overlap with adaptation. There can be times that there's just no way to preserve a core element due to resource constraints. Um, but, but more often we would probably see these as modifications that um, were not made in a planful way. At least that's our hypothesis. Next slide. Um, and so as we think about adaptation and modification and this, this um, core elements um, issue, I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about this. We, um, we see in constructs like the CFER um, and others that there's this sense of core components versus the adaptable periphery. You know, those are things you can kind of um, make some changes with around the edges, but they don't really interfere with these core aspects of the intervention. And if we go to the next slide, um, as we're making adaptations, what we would, what we would theorize, um, what we would think is that the, the optimal um, is this upper right qu quadrant where they're planned and they're fidelity consistent. Now, I wanna be really clear, you can plan an adaptation um, even if it happens in mid-project. In mid so for example, um, with COVID-19, you know, for example, there could be home visits um, that were planned um, as, as part of an intervention. And those are less feasible when everyone's sheltering in place or when people are um, you know, trying to, to remain um, socially distanced or physically distanced. So, but, so you can have an adaptation that happens in the middle of a project where you say, well, we move the home visits to Zoom visits, or now we have the home visitor come and they stay in their car and they open the window and the other the person comes outside and they have masks on, that could still be planned. Um, and if it's fidelity consistent, as long as there's some form of a visit. Um, there might also be things that are um, theoretically ideal in unexpected circumstances. So let's say those first couple of weeks of shelter in place where everybody was just doing the best they could and they had, there wasn't really a, a good way to, to look at what was gonna be essential. And so um, there can be fidelity consistent adaptations that were made in a more unplanned manner. So this maybe is when the home visitors were just figuring out for themselves what to do um, to make sure that the home visit still happened. Over on the left, we see fidelity inconsistent adaptations. Um, and really the key thing about both of these is that if we're tracking our adaptations and we're really measuring carefully, they present opportunities for learning. We could learn, for example, that um, something we thought was a core element or function really isn't. Um, we could also learn that, um, that you know, there, there are ways to find, refine or simplify um, the intervention, or we can learn, yep, this was in fact a core element and uh, we, we probably shouldn't have removed it. Next slide. So when we think about core elements and functions, this comes up in particular when we are looking at, um, uh, when we're looking at the um, more complex interventions. So complex interventions um, have multiple components um, and they, um, they might target a more complex population. 
Um, they might require multifaceted strategies um, or they might need to uh, be working in a really complex and dynamic environment. So there are a number of different factors that, that make us think about intervention complexity. Um, and when we see a more complex intervention, we are more likely um, to need to make some sort of adaptation um, to the, the program, the intervention, um, or the way that it's implemented. Next slide. So we've been talking about core elements and components, um, and particularly in, in, um, the, in the context of more complex interventions. So what do we actually mean? These are the parts that are either empirically or if there isn't good research yet, um, theoretically associated with the desired impacts um, or outcomes. And so they're the parts that are really effective and necessary. Um, these might not be the same in all contexts. Texts. For example, you might have a population where you really need a very heavy education component because health literacy is lower or they're newly diagnosed, for example. Um, and then in some contexts, you might find, uh, for example, that, um, that you're dealing with a, a group um, of people who's done a lot more research. You know, maybe it's a, maybe it's a, a support group that um, recruits people from online forums. And, you know, these people like have spent a lot of time on the forums and have learned a lot about um, the disease or the health issue. Um, so in different contexts, you may or may, you know, the, the core elements may or may not be the same. And this is, again, a reason why we might want to measure. And sometimes this might mean um, attending to function rather than the form. And I'll explain what we mean here on the next slide. Um, so the core, we've been thinking about interventions until recently as, you know, core elements. Um, so these things might be um, education, it might be, you know, getting people active, it might be um, you know, medication adherence. Let's say these are some of the, the core elements of the intervention. When we shift to thinking about core functions, though, we're actually thinking about what, um, what the underlying function is of these interventions. Um, and so it becomes less about how you do it and more about the fact that it's done, that in, in one form or another, the education took place. In one form or another, people increase their physical activity. And if we go to the next slide, um, there has been some, uh, some papers, a, a, a paper that came out recently that really explains this concept um, is, uh, it just came out in the last year or two. Um, and this really um, shows how the core, different forms can be tailored to achieve for core functions. So if we just take the first, um, this first section here below, we can see that, for example, different and enhanced options for access to in-person care could take, um, that's the function. And the form could be in-person care outside of traditional business hours, same day appointments. So it could take different forms. And so when we think about um, adapting and we wanna be fidelity consistent, if we attend to function, that gives us a little bit more flexibility to meet the needs of the population. So we would not say it's fidelity inconsistent if we're not, um, you know, if, if the, the form is different. So another, another is, uh, example is if you're educating people about depression, um, by form, it would be everybody gets this written information kit. By function, it could be tailored to the local population needs. It could be a video that people watch and then have a discussion with a peer. It could be, um, it could be a written document. It could be uh, psychoeducation delivered by a practitioner. Um, and what's key is the function. And that's one way to sort of think about how to remain fidelity consistent while still adapting, uh, particularly by attending to functions. Um, next slide. And um, this is a, uh, just an example of a, a fairly recent paper um, that um, presents a theory-based method for identifying and reporting core functions and forms of evidence-based interventions. And this is especially useful, I think, if you're, um, trying to uh, figure out, okay, when we're making adaptations, what's the, core, what's the core function? What's the key thing we're trying to do? And what are the different ways that we could do it? Um, and this also has implications for training. So once you learn um, some of the different uh, forms that can work for different populations, you can integrate that into your training. Um, so people, when they're, um, when they're trying to make their own adaptations in their own projects or in their own communities, they have a sense of how to achieve the function, the key function or the key goal um, while uh, still attending to fidelity. 
So let's pause here and see if there are any questions. Um, I don't know if there have been any in the chat at this point. Um, if not, we can kind of move to the next topic um, and then we'll have a little more time for Q&A later. Oh, we've got one from David. How many of our evidence-based interventions do we think have empirically derived forms and functions? I think that's a really good question, David, because I think that um, a lot of times intervention developers um, until, until maybe more recently and until people really started developing and, and looking to, to implement and to, to you know, spread these interventions more rapidly, um, I think manuals were written really um, with more attention to form. Um, and, and I would say that it's only been more recently um, that, that people have really been enumerating the, the core functions. A lot of times we're learning empirically about um, what the core functions are as or you know different different um, forms are as people um, as people are um, writing about their efforts to sort of spread or roll out these interventions in different um, communities. So I would say a fairly low proportion. Although I suspect that you know as you work with intervention um, developers and purveyors, that in their in their in their minds they could they, you know they could very quickly tell you if they were consulting with you like oh yeah you know you could show a video instead of giving them written materials or oh yeah you can adapt that and simplify it um, but I don't know that they've been laid out as well and I think that you know as we are learning you know integrating that right into manuals and trainings would be a, a big service to the field. Other questions. Well, and this yeah. is great. On, I think, to the next section, uh, Shannon, because we have this very tight schedule to get through the three topics, but we will uh, bring those questions with us to the end. Is that okay? Sure, and I can answer some in the chat, too. That would be great. Thank you so much, Shannon and Anna. And I will hand this over to Anna and Chris now, and we apologize for the tight timeline, but we want to give you these resources so you can further learn about it. The hour is very short. Yeah, and so introducing topic, topic two, I guess one way to view this is just that this is maybe one way to get at the question that David proposed. Um, one way to get at the core functions and core um, elements of evidence-based interventions are to document adaptations and then to use that to kind of feedback and see what things are working. Um, but in here, we're going to talk about specifically planning adaptations. What are the tools that we have and can offer to folks? Um, to, that can be useful for planning and documenting the adaptations in real time. So moving on to the next slide. I um, wanted to start here, just a, a scoping uh, study here by uh, Cam Escoffrey and colleagues. Um, this is one of several different kind of stage-based or phase-based approaches to planning out adaptations. Um, I think that these kinds of models can be really useful kind of for kind of going through steps for helping to plan um, how adaptations might be put into practice for your intervention study, your implementation study, or simply your real world practice. And then uh, in the interest of time, I'll pass it on to the next slide and pass it over to Anna. So this is another uh, set of planning uh, steps and you can have that, you have that the website over there. Next. We just want to point out, we've talked about what is adaptation, adaptation planning, fidelity, consistent fidelity, inconsistent. And we want to highlight, highlight the, the role of context and how then context affects all of the pieces in, 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 in our implementation process. So if you can go next. So context has been like this backdrop, right? It's like we, we still don't know what to do with context. This is another proctor's uh, framework, right, is at the end, but it's affecting all of those boxes, if you can go next. Context is also part of CIFR, right, outer setting, inner setting. And uh, David, I'm not going to go through this, but uh, your uh, the dynamic sustainability framework, right, really conceptualizing that context affects the, the, the implementation process. Um, next. In addition to this, um, just wanted to briefly mention that um, we talked about kind of some stage based approaches to planning adaptations and there are also some kind of iterative or feedback based um, tools for kind of planning out adaptations. Um, I'm not going to cover Maddie in any great detail here because I believe that Shannon will be covering that under topic three. Um, but if you go to the next slide, I can show you the idea or the, as it says here, iterative decision making for evaluation of adaptations. 
Um, we had to put the word evaluation in the title because otherwise the IDEA acronym, acronym really didn't come together. Um, but for those who are interested, this is in the, the Journal of Community Psychology. And it really just spells out a process to go through and thinking about whether adaptations are needed and how they should be evaluated and rolled out. Um, this is relatively new, but I do know that some folks, including uh, Becca Serpata, have actually started to use this to actually describe the process of planning adaptation. So we're glad that it's at least starting to get some use and we're hopeful that it will uh, get a bit of momentum moving forward. Um, next slide. So I also wanna highlight that there is an entire field and an entire book of frameworks on to help you think about how to adapt, right? There is an, a field of cultural adaptation, which was born to adapt evidence-based interventions for minority populations, vulnerable populations. So this is one of the books and Guillermo Bernal and Melanie Dominic Rodriguez are one of the leaders. Um, on the other side, we also put two empirical papers. One is by Dr. Leopoldo Cabasa using collaborative intervention planning approach. And the next one is one of the work that we did in Mexico where we mapped EPIS, so Greg Aaron's Exploration and Preparation Implementation Sustainment Framework with one of the cultural adaptation frameworks, mapping those two together and showing uh, that it, it takes a while uh, if you're going to do really thoughtful planning adaptation process. Next. Uh, going, uh, this is another paper by Escofri and, and his team and, and showing the importance of uh, adaptation, also reviewing adaptation um, of interventions and the importance, which I also want to highlight, the cultural appropriateness. And so thinking really uh, who are your um, the people participating in your projects and, and, and how can you really incorporate and adapt for culture and targeting your new population. Next. So uh, in thinking about adapting, and I will, I will bring the equity space at the forefront, right? Especially we, are, we heard COVID today, there is an equity workshop happening right now uh, and not talking about equity and talking about adaptation uh, would be uh, a missed opportunity. So if you think about adaptation, we talked about adapting interventions. We talked about adapting interventions to fit the context, but as you adapt to the intervention, there is a play in terms of the strategies, right? So uh, one of the ideas here, then this is coming from the paper with Leo Cabas and I, is thinking about adaptation as a, as a strategy where you have that interplay of the intervention, of the strategy, and how those two then play together as uh, in, in the context to then affect implementation outcomes services and planning outcomes. Next. I apologize. We have a few minutes. We made up a few minutes here. So I would like to open up for discussion now. And I know that Anna, you are going to, um, or Shannon is going to uh, facilitate this. I am. Sorry, I think we've been covering a lot of the questions in the chat, but um, one that just came up is what are your thoughts on multi level adaptation tracking and evaluation. I'm thinking an individual site or system could have, ad have adaptation of different aspects of an intervention. Um, and I can just say quickly like that, that is certainly true and um, we'll be showing a framework later that can capture the levels that different adaptations happened. Because you're right, within a single system, adaptations can happen very differently at different sites to respond to different needs. I also saw here, uh, Shannon, I don't know if you catch, caught that, but do you have any suggests? No, that was not the one. I'm sorry, I'm looking at. Track or measure. I think that that's going to come up with the next section, so we will keep yeah. it for that. It doesn't sound like any new questions are coming up. No, I think that's right. And Stephanie, a lot of them are I love anticipating sorry. our next sections. Yeah. Yeah. I love the uh, the comment about the spirit of the intervention uh, to core functions. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's exactly right. Yeah. Very nice. Okay. Yeah. And Paula, I'll, I'll just say this, this question about the QI um where context is emphasized yeah i think that that's one of the nice things from the dynamic sustainability framework is the idea that 
you know, a lot of times we can't do big experiments or controlled studies of which adaptations are going to work in time to be of use to our stakeholders. And so these QI approaches that, you know, the um, small tests of change, the PDSA cycles are really essential. And, you know, particularly if we document well, you know, in this particular context, for these particular reasons, we tried this change. Um, and then that's how we saw, you know, where we saw, um, you know, different impacts. Um, so there's a question, at what point are adaptations so small or common sense that they might not be worth tracking? Or is there no such thing? That's a great question. Who wants to tackle it? <laughs> I would just say we have been talking about this because it can be bothersome to collect this information. We will talk about this in the next section. And we talked about that, you know, there are so many things that are interesting, even changing our measures or, you know, design changes. And so you can really go crazy. So I think that reflecting on what will be actionable and what will actually improve your likelihood to be improving outcomes for your populations is what I would put out as my kind of question as, you know, what information will actually help me do a better job bringing this intervention to my target population, especially those most in need. And so if you use that, I think that then you will not get into this um, little bit academic, uh, that would be fun type of data collection, because it can be burdensome on the participants and on your team. So that would be my, my kind of going back to my place and thinking, why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. again, can I give you a counterpoint for that? Because I love how pragmatic you are and, and I, I really appreciate this. That, all that she said, and, and I think we have a slide later on, you guys are, are three steps ahead, thinking about adaptation for whom and why. Um, so let me give you a very concrete example, super fast, and then we can move on. Um, think about parent intervention given in a home, right? Uh, in, in the case of the intervention that I work, Generation PMTO, where we work with the parents, not with the kids. And one adaptation could be, for example, having the presence of the kids or having the TV on. So in our manuals, we were trained, parents should be you know, all eyes on me, no TV on. But if you put that in a context of, say, and this is true case, so I'm not making up, a white therapist in a black, in a family of a black parents, where TV's on, kids are running, music is on, everybody's very loud. And the white therapist did not know what to do with that. So part of what we needed to talk is, again, going back to the core functions and form, right? What is the function of that interaction and what is the form? So uh, yes to all that Borsica said and think about contextual factors and cultural aspects because a small little thing might have actually huge impact on your uh, project. I love that. Yeah, Shannon. great. Um, look, go ahead and react to that if you want, Borsica, and then I'll just mention another thing that came up in the chat. No, no, I, I think we have um, time for one more question. So if you could do that, Shannon, and then we will move on to the next section and we will get back to the questions again. Sure. Yeah. Um, one of the other questions is um, how do these models, how can they be applied to unplanned COVID stimulated adaptations? And we'll talk about that actually in, in the next section. So we'll give some examples. That's great. Why don't I continue sharing uh, the mm -hmm. slides now again? I found it and we'll do this. Uh, all good? Yep. And okay, so we are going to start talking about how we actually document adaptations and then what we do once we've documented them. Um, next slide. Okay, is this, this one's mine or yours? Both of these is mine, right? Sorry, I had the numbers of the slides written down and then they're, <laughs> they're not numbered. <laughs> I'm um, sorry, Shannon. so you are going to go until my example comes up. Or perfect. Is Great, okay. So why do we document adaptations? We've already talked a little bit about this, but we wanna understand the types of adaptations that people might consider or that, that you know, we've learned something about um, that can be useful in different contexts. Um, this, there's very important process data um, to interpret outcomes, you know, how, uh, both from a, you know, in a, in a mixed method study, some of this might be 
from a more qualitative perspective to provide more information um, or to be more descriptive. And then also we'll show some examples of using them quantitatively. Um, this allows us to consider refinements um, to the intervention and implementation strategies based on what we learn um, about the adaptations if we document them well. Um, and um, they can also help us start to develop more replicable, easy to use documentation methods. The more we start documenting and learning, um, the, the more we can kind of have a shared language and, um, and, and have some common understandings about what's happening. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so there have been, um, there have actually been several different approaches to documenting adaptations, including some um, taxonomies that we actually referred to when we um, developed the frame. Um, but here are a few of the kind of more recent papers that um, have, have kind of looked at the idea of documenting and looking at types of adaptations. Um, so the next slide, including by the way, the Roscoe one kind of looked at the type of coverage that some of them had. So this is a framework that we developed. Um, we actually expanded from a 2013 version, which was um, much simpler. And this, edit, this is really, um, we wanted to make this comprehensive. So if you were going to try to do a very careful, thorough, um, non-pragmatic maybe, um, effort to uh, adapt and track your adaptations, you might, or your modifications, you might use this full framework. And we'll talk about how to do this more pragmatically, but we wanted to cover both the process and the reasons. So the process walks through when it happened, you know, did it happen at pre-implementation or during scale up, sustainment, um, were they planned or unplanned, who participated, um, and also you can indicate who made the ultimate decision. This can be really important in different um, global settings, um, you know, global health settings where, you know, certain things might not happen. You know, if it's more hierarchical, you might need certain people to be on board and make the ultimate decision. So the who can be really important, um, you know, in terms of buy-in and how successful it is. What's modified? Is it the content of the intervention itself? Is it to how it's delivered? Is it to the way that people are trained or is it to uh, implementation and other scale-up activities? Um, the level, so this gets at one of the questions that we had earlier. Did you just do this for one person? Maybe, um, maybe you had to make an adaptation for somebody who was hearing impaired. And so you attended to the core functions, um, but uh, you still, and you changed the form. Um, but it could also happen, you know, all the way up to throughout a whole network or system or community, they make an adaptation. Um, and then the context modifications, oh, if you don't mind just zipping back up for a quick second, um, context modifications are things like format, setting personnel. The nature is really the content. So this is, you know, these minor tiny changes, tailoring, tweaking, all the way to recording, um, removing, reordering, um, or drifting and, and departing or integrating other interventions. And then down at the bottom, we have the goal, oh, we have the relationship to core components, and we have the goal and the reasons. So the reasons map onto social determinants and implementation. Um, constructs to potential determinants. And then the goal is uh, kind of maps onto outcomes. So is it about feasibility? Is it about um, effectiveness? Um, is it about reducing cost, et cetera? Next slide, please. We've been asked whether this is something that people can apply to implementation strategies. And the frame was really developed for interventions. Um, we are have, we have written revise and resubmit. We have a frame for implementation strategies that is gonna be a little bit more tailored to implementation strategies themselves. So we're hoping we'll be able to show that with you soon. And I believe Chris has a poster at this conference that goes into more detail. Um, next slide, please. Um, just so you know, there are um, resources, including code books, modifiable code books, some examples of self reports, um, and some articles that use the frame and the idea, as well as links to those papers um, on this website. And Anna also um, tweeted out an annotated reading list and a list of resources. Um, so if you're on Twitter, you can find that. Um, there's also going to be a link to it on this web page. Next slide. Um, so some different ways to document um, modifications and adaptations. Um, an interview by someone who knows the frame code book well enough to be able to ask the kinds of questions they would need to be able to code it. Um, and we keep the interview pretty simple and then we use a lot of probes. One thing I think it's really important to ask is how do you know if it's working? You know, do you have a process for evaluating? Um, and that's been really um, illustrative for, for me as I've done that. Next slide. 
these are just some examples of observations. So this is observation that we do while we're doing fidelity monitoring of therapy sessions. And there's just a checklist of different types of adaptations um, that people might make or modifications. Um, and they tend to be dichotomous. Next slide. Again, your coders need to have decision rules and know the um, know the slide. Um, there are also self reports that people can you know just put up uh, like a checklist of different types of adaptations. We have some examples of that on the website as well. Of course, there are challenges to self report like recall accuracy. Sometimes people think something's a modification that's really not. Um, provider burden and record keeping. Whereas for observation, it takes time, it takes resources. Some require you to actually watch multiple interactions or sessions to see if they happen. For example, spreading out over multiple sessions, et cetera. So um, it, it requires a lot of work. And then of course, whenever you observe something, you can change it. Um, so you might actually need to triangulate and use multiple methods. And I will tell you that um, we have some work that Clara Johnson's been leading to look at the um, sort of correspondence between self-report and observation. Self-report, if it was done at an annual interview, self-report checklists, and then um, uh, observation. And the concordance is highest for observation, but it's still like, you know, and that might be because observers don't see multiple sessions, whereas, um, you know, whereas uh, people are reporting on something that might happen over the span of multiple sessions. So we are still learning, but um, none of these, none of these are perfect. Um, this is, this is something that you really might need multiple methods and Borsica will be telling us in just a minute about ways that they've looked at adaptations and modifications. Next slide. Um, just a little bit more about observation. Um, uh, I think it's really important, again, um, to not think you're getting the whole picture by just watching by a single observation and that it really can make sense. And I'll show you an example of how we did this later to both assess fidelity and adaptation at the same time. So you can get a whole picture of fidelity consistent and inconsistent and um, see the ways that adaptation can happen in the context of fidelity or outside of fidelity. Um, and um, next slide. I think this Thank is what so And I would take it over. I'm going to keep this example very short. We decided to add this because the work that we have been doing was uh, based on Shannon's uh, original 2013 um, framework and then we expanded it with the REAM framework and we thought about applying it in the context of the VA where we were working with the query program and this publication came out we have another one um, actually under review on the results of the adaptations for one of the studies but it focused on uh, five studies and we tried to do adaptation tracking across all of those the similar way of course it didn't work out as clearly as we were hoping. And so I just wanted to point out that, you know, tracking adaptations is very challenging. I mentioned already that it can be uh, burdensome. So you have to be thinking through how you can build into the existing processes in your study and collect information that you would already be collecting um, and match up the adaptation data collection with those. Um, and so as you can see in these uh, projects, which were, different from the projects that Shannon originally worked with in the uh, context of the original Sturman model of uh, more manualized psychotherapies. This was applied to very messy real world QI research projects. And so when uh, Shannon and Anna talked about, you know, complex interventions, and it's important for us to identify core functions. In the case of these, it's, it's really critical because truly nothing is prescribed and the implementation strategies overlap with the interventions. So it's hard to separate them out. And so when you talk about adaptations, the first question is, well, what is the baseline? What are we doing adaptations to? And often people can't describe these easily. So that was one of the processes we undertook is describing these interventions as much as we could and then work with the implementation team, the clinical team to understand how this change. And um, as I mentioned, we started with uh, Shannon's original framework and added on some constructs. As you can see, Shannon's updated frame has some parallel kind of additions. So these are very similar um, in my view. Um, uh, so no, no need to kind of differentiate the different frameworks. The, the piece that we highlighted from early on just to make sense for ourselves is that we are expecting to see adaptations in this project for the intervention, the implementation strategy, and the context. And then we are also expecting um, temporary differences, planning stage uh, during implementation and following implementation or sustainment stage. 
And so as we were thinking about our adaptations, we were reflecting on these various types of um, targets for adaptation and then also the different time points. And we have been kind of playing around with this, aligned it also with the um, uh, VA's um, roadmap um, and query roadmap. So this, this has been working well for us. And as you know, Shannon suggested, I stole this slide from actually her. Uh, as we think about various kind of methodologies, they use observations and self-report and different records. We can get a fuller picture of adaptations. In our case, we use two methods. We use interviews uh, about mid implementation and at the end. And then we also used real-time tracking. And here you can see some sample interview questions that mapped on to the framework. Um, it took about 45 minutes to do those. We have been working on shortening them, but they are pretty extensive. Um, we provide um, these as well. So if you need these, they are linked out of the paper or I can send you a link. And then we also use the so-called real-time tracking form that was filled out by our implementer um, in some cases, it was a, a nurse coordinator. In other cases, it was a research assistant who was embedded in the clinic. So it, it changed in each project. Um, and they were supposed to fill this out weekly and include um, information about the adaptation and uh, align these modifications as they relate to the framework. Again, you can recognize now some of these by whom, what, uh, at what level. So this was uh, two different forms of data collection. Um, the analysis, again, for one of the projects is completed and it's been really wonderful to uh, look at these findings. And uh, there is a presentation tomorrow. It's the first uh, session. Um, it's um, Michaela McCrate who is uh, leading it. McCarthy, I apologize. And if you are interested, you can kind of get a sense of the outcomes. I'm going to um, glean through these slides, but just mention that there are some developments on thinking about what other ways we can collect information about adaptations during implementation. One that I really love is a qualitative approach using periodic reflections by Erin Finley and colleagues. And then we have been thinking about using the REAM framework to do mid-course adaptations and guide them in a more kind of formal way instead of um, kind of letting the projects do it when they feel we check in with them and see whether there is a need for adaptation if we want to achieve our goals. So there's a paper about that. And finally, I wanted uh, you to be aware of this other paper that um, reported on adaptations using the frame. Um, Gloria Coronado and colleagues around colorectal cancer screening. It's a wonderful study and there is a follow up to this coming out um, um, that will be using some more quantitative approaches to uh, report the, on this uh, work. So I will hand it back to Shannon and uh, Shannon, we have about um, two, three minutes uh, and we will have to take questions. Great, okay, I'll fly through this. Okay, adaptation um, and outcomes, next slide. So once we tracked these things very carefully, um, there's been some thinking that if the more we do this, um, we can have kind of a repository of information about how different types of interventions have been adapted and what the outcomes are. If we do this, then we can start to learn by kind of pooling information from different projects to start really getting at this, what types of adaptations can be effective and what context for which populations. Um, next slide. And, you know, things like the frame give us kind of a shared language. Um, the Maddie has integrated the flame at the, the frame and, um, and has added really this um, attention to using the goals and reasons, alignment with fidelity, um, and whether it was made kind of systematically or not um, as different potential moderating or mediating factors um, to look at a variety of outcomes. So this is kind of a nice way of, um, of looking at how you can structure your evaluation and looking at both intended and unintended um, consequences and outcomes. Next slide. So when we want to look at impact on um, outcomes, it's key to really talk with your stakeholders and find out which ones are going to be most important to them. It might be things like uh, clinical change, et cetera, but they might also be interested in things like engagement, satisfaction, acceptability. So make sure that you're checking in with your stakeholders as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, okay, this did not get uh, shifted over. This is Anna, so I'm gonna let Anna present this one and then I'll go back and present mine. Uh, it's all good. We're, we're adapting as we go. 
Um, so this, so when we talk about adaptation, right, we need to think about fidelity, um, as, as Shannon was talking about. And this is a work by Marion Forgatch and her team on, it used to be called Parenting Management Training Oregon Model, and they just changed their name to Generation PMTO. Um, there are two things that I want to highlight about fidelity and adaptation. This is within session, intervention fidelity of the therapist to the core components of the model. So we know what we need to do. We know how to do. There is a checklist and we know how to score. And you can see here that the intervention fidelity is then, uh, then relates to improvement in parenting practices, which then affects child outcome. Those sessions, as Shannon was talking about, uh, in PMTO, we observe, it's videotaped, and we have uh, a, a checklist. So this is a more mature, and, and some of the questions are about what, how do you identify core components. PMTO is a very mature intervention. We have, we, we meet weekly, monthly to talk about fidelity. What I also want to highlight in terms of fidelity of the intervention and across uh, sustainment is, if you take a look at her work, and of her team's work in Iceland and Norway, what we're seeing is if you train the first generation of therapists, so for example, I train Shannon, and then the first generation of therapists train the second generation, Shannon trains Chris, fidelity drops across generation, and then he comes and picks it up. And so it's important for us to also think about adaptation, not only within session of the intervention, but also across the implementation process and sustainment process um, as we move forward to maturity of the, inter of the uh, intervention. Next. Okay. And next slide. Um, so this is a somewhat similar approach. This was audio recorded cognitive processing therapy sessions in a clinic that um, served a large Hispanic Latino population. Um, and cognitive processing therapy was adapted for individuals with PTSD presenting in this clinic through a very systematic approach. Um, this is work by Luana Marquez and colleagues. So we looked at fidelity and we looked at adaptation at the same time. And you can see that we were able to track um, fidelity consistent. So first of all, adherence and confidence, two components of fidelity were associated with um, changes in PTSD. Um, so higher confidence, better outcomes, um, for PTSD, higher adherence, better outcomes for depression. Um, but then uh, fidelity consistent modifications made by the therapists um, in the sessions. So these were, these were not planned necessarily, but they were things that the therapists did in session were associated with more positive outcomes in both PTSD and depression. Um, so they preserved the core functions and elements of the intervention and um, they also were able to see improvement in outcomes. Um, and this is kind of where we wanna get, right? We wanna be able to, um, we wanna be able to describe processes, et cetera, but we also wanna to get to a point where we can really answer the question, what's the impact of making these modifications on the outcomes that, that we're seeing? Um, next slide, please. I think we're at questions. We are, and we are almost out of time. So what I will do, we have a few slides that provided you with additional details. While Anna is taking a questions, a couple, I think we can, I will just walk you through and you can kind of see what else we had for you as a resource. And I don't know yet how it's gonna be shared with you, but we are going to share the slides with you. So Anna, please go ahead with the questions and then I am going to just walk through the slides while you talk. Yeah, so Shannon, uh, I, I uh, there is a question about equity um, and how can you speak to equity considerations for adapting if and when folks do not have access to technology? Absolutely. Yeah, and I actually typed something in the chat. So I'll just very briefly say, um, this is a place where, you know, we were, we were looking at less than optimal, um, you know, less than optimal ways to, to provide a psychotherapy that requires worksheets over the phone, right? Because you couldn't look and see what they were doing, et cetera. So, you know, we had to get creative and we had to say, well, listen, we're just going to simplify forms, you know, worksheets are going to, you know, instead of these big Cadillac type worksheets, you know, we're going to like really, really compress, you know, and just look at the very key things that we're trying to get. So for cognitive restructuring, instead of a big five column worksheet, it turned into catch, check, change. Um, and, you know, people catch their thoughts, check their thoughts, change their thoughts. 
Um, so we sent that to people. We made videos so if they did have a smartphone, they could stream instructions on how to fill out these videos. Um, and the goal for those types of things um, were so that we didn't have to tell people, sorry, you're gonna have to spend, suspend your psychotherapy until COVID's over, or we're just gonna be doing check-ins, which is what some of these programs naturally move to is just 15 minute check-ins with people um, where there could be no you know, sort of more therapeutic work other than you know, some support, which is of course important and, and necessary. Um, but to really keep giving people tools, a lot of it was about simplification um, and, and, and needing to slow the pace down, just recognizing that there was less that could be done um, in individual sessions. Um, same thing with things like home visits. You know, there are programs that increase the frequency. Um, there are programs that decrease the frequency or had you know, a phone call, um, you know, more frequent phone calls and then you know, briefer in-person uh, check-ins. So I think you know, these are things that we really need to be thinking about in terms of you know, when, when access is limited um, in part because people just have less technology, um, you know, this is where this attention to function becomes really critical. Uh, so that we can preserve what's going to be, you know, what we think is going to be most effective and necessary while still making sure it reaches as many people as possible. And we are over time. I am happy to stay on if uh, others still would like to, um, you know, wait for some of the questions. Um, but I know that some of you will have to leave. So we will share the slides, but we appreciate your participation and I can hang around a little bit longer. Thank you very much, everybody. Yes, thank you. And maybe while people are signing off from the kind of digital divide perspective, also wondering about, you know, for, for integrated health systems, I know some examples like VA where um, the health system decided it is worth your while to simply send iPads to people who don't have them. Um, the, the idea being that it's worth addressing that disparity and that even from a financial perspective, it will end up saving the health system money and save our veterans or our patients heartache and pain if we just have the upfront cost for the technology, expecting that that'll pay dividends down the road. I know that's not always a possibility, but I think that's one of the examples where looking at the system level, rather than putting everything at the patient or the provider or clinic level, um, that adaptation of doing things more primarily through technology that we can provide to people may be better off for some folks than trying to shift everything to phone or more simplified pieces. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, I am trying to share the chat in case there were questions that we didn't get to and we want to, so I'm going to try to do that. Okay, yeah, I just looked at, uh, I just responded to one in the chat. Um, I don't know if people, this is this webinar or this is meeting because people could probably just open up and. Mm -hmm. Miranda, uh, regarding your effectiveness of adaptations, uh, the, the, uh, this is the field of cultural adaptation. Ha we have some, not we, because I haven't done anything, but they have some meta-analysis showing that actually you adapting increase retention and effectiveness of the interventions. Um, so I, I'm happy to send some of those resources if you want. Um, I think part of what we need to do from the field of implementation science is track in our work, how we're adapting and whether that helps uh, implementation outcomes, right? And, and all the other pieces that we are interested on. But there are some, some data from, from the field of cultural adaptation. And if I can add, the more that the folks use kind of these different frameworks for tracking adaptations, the easier it'll be to notice whether or which adaptations are associated with changes in effectiveness. But if you're not at least pragmatically documenting the adaptations, you don't even have the tools to address that question in the first place. And I know I'm exactly. preaching to the choir here with this audience, but still worth noting. And you know, one thing just to mention, I don't know if we covered it quite as much in the presentation, but um, you know, the, the frame can be really simplified to things that you think are most likely to happen. Um, you know, so instead, and, and you can fill in the timing later, for example, and not require people to be tracking that themselves. So you don't need to say pre-implementation for, you know, just have them fill out the content. If that's what your providers are most likely going to be um, looking at as format and content, just give them checklists with format and content. And you can even hone in and say, this is a single session intervention. So maybe they're going to spread it out. They're unlikely to shorten it, you know, 
or you know, really tailor it to the types of things you think you're gonna see. And so it's much more pragmatic and easy for people to track in real time. I also love the discussion about the impact because when we looked at adaptation um, from these five projects and one specifically, the least common information that we had was what was the impact? Because people were either guessing or they had subjective impressions about it, but they didn't necessarily have objective data to be able to say that because I made this change, this resulted in a better or different outcome, whether it's an implementation outcome or an um, effectiveness outcome. So that certainly is the next step and we are excited to try some things. Very good. Well, we um, I think we have the chat recorded and we are very excited. Thank you so much for hanging out with us and staying on longer. We are um, going to post these and um, we'll uh, look forward to interacting with you on Twitter as well.